Thank you, Mary, and thanks to the organizing committee for uh, inviting me here. And I will also uh, apologize in advance if I do not do justice to some of the other projects that I'm presenting. Uh, Mary asked us to say a little bit about ourselves. Uh, just so that you, I can set kind of the perspective for this presentation, I am a professor in the Department of Horticulture at Oregon State University, but I have a, an extension research and teaching appointment. I'm a senior, I hate that word, faculty member in our department, and I would say 75% or more of my career to date has been with conventional farmers, and I'm doing organic research now because the industry, the conventional and some organic growers ask me to do so. So that's kind of an interesting uh, start to my organic work. Um, so what I'd like to do is, first of all, uh, let's see, the big green button, yes. There's about a dozen projects through NIFA OREI that would cover the fruit crops range. A couple of these are a new projects that started this year. And you can see that it's distributed throughout the US approximately half of them are on berry crops and half are on, on tree fruit crops. And I'd like to thank those of you who contributed to this presentation. I'm going to use some of the material provided uh, for most of these individuals. So what I'd like to do is give some sense for uh, what, what really I've heard some of the limitations are with regard to organic fruit crop research. And what I hear a lot is that the demand for organic fruit crops is really high, and there are opportunities for growth. And as soon as there are opportunities for growth, that's when the industry stands up and takes notice. And I've heard a lot of comments from industry about how they'd love to get into organic fruit crop research because there's an opportunity for making money. Uh, but really, they need information on how sustainable these organic fruit crop production systems are. And there's really little information in organic fruit crops on long-term studies that are well designed and well replicated to look at the impact of these production systems on the key issues that some of these industries have in the different production regions such as weeds, insects, disease, soil quality, yield, and fruit quality and nutritional properties of the fruit. And even though it's very tempting uh, growers are very hesitant to make the transition or to start new organic plantings without some key indicators on what these costs are likely to be and also what are some of the risks involved in organic production system uh, in these various fruit crops. Uh, these are very intelligent uh, folks and they don't want to start something without knowing uh, what all these risks are. Now in some regions of the US, uh, most organic farms are uh, generally small, they're family owned, uh, they're often selling locally or regionally, and what, uh, I've, what they've shared with me is that some of their challenges are to remain sustainable from a family economic standpoint, getting a year-round income stream. Now in many regions like the one I'm from in the Pacific Northwest, uh, growers are, we have these small local uh, farms, but we also have extremely large organic uh, tree fruit as well as berry crop farms, well over 200 acres in size. And they're industry interested, uh, some of these uh, conventional growers also are interested in transitioning to these organic farms, and they're not going to do that without uh, knowing what some of these risks and what the costs are. Also, there's been a lot of interest in uh, industry-driven research on organic production systems. In fact, I wouldn't be doing organic research without industry funding. But one of the key challenges that was brought up earlier today that we have in regions like the Pacific Northwest is a lot of the levies that are provided through commodity commissions come uh, almost exclusively from conventional growers. And some commissions, for example, our Oregon Raspberry and Blackberry Commission, are mandated such that they are not allowed to support organic uh, research because the organic growers have lobbied in the past to not pay levies. So these are some of the challenges that we have. Uh, the NIFA ORAI uh, funding program really has provided 
a new avenue, and I, I want to stress this for peer-reviewed research, well-designed projects that there's a lot of trust in, not just from industry, but, but also from, from our colleagues throughout the world. And what I really like, and I can speak to this personally as many of us can, is that these, uh, the industry has been so integrally involved in many of the projects that we're talking about here. Uh, these partnerships, the advisory groups, uh, they help determine our barriers to success and they give us ideas for what opportunities. And many of us are, are narrow-minded in our old, uh, uh, you know, sort of academic worlds and don't have complete holistic pictures of what some of these challenges are. And, and not just challenges in research, but also in disseminating the information. And to put it blunt, you know, when an organization like NIFA and OAI uh, says you have to, to get funding, develop partnerships with industry and extension and research partnerships. It's funny how we all tend to do that when it's important to get funding. And the key, the key thing is that many of us, after doing these projects for a long period of time, have, have realized how much this has enriched uh, the research and extension programs that we are doing. Um, I'd, I'd like to say that industry not only is critical in designing these projects, but uh, as you'll see, they're integral in helping uh, change these projects as needed as we go through, and also in disseminating the research, not just orally, but also as co-authors on extension publications and research papers. So what I'd like to do is quickly uh, give an overview of a project that I had uh, funded, myself and my colleagues. Uh, we've been doing this study in organic blueberries for uh, about three years now uh, through the NEFA program, but this study started uh, much earlier. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, my industry uh, advisory board uh, members and participants. And as I said, this project started before the NEFA or AI funding, and you can see it includes uh, grower collaborators as well as uh, packer or processor or marketing collaborators, because after all, we have to sell the fruit. And we have USDA as well as extension and, and research partners. So our objectives were uh, to determine the effect of these organic production systems in blueberry on all the key obvious things like yield and fruit quality and weed pressure, but also plant top and root growth, the soil and plant water status, and soil and plant nutrient status. Every single one of these objectives was established by the industry. In addition, we are collecting uh, data on the costs, uh, which after all, as you've heard, is one of the key questions that growers have. Uh, this uh, plot was established, one acre is certified organic planting, certified by Oregon Tilth, and it was established at the North Willamette Research and Extension Center, which is a branch station of uh, OSU. And it was established in uh, a fall 2006, and this is an interesting, uh, very brief uh, story. It was the conventional growers who came to me and asked me to start organic research, whether I'd be interested in doing that, because they saw an opportunity. And uh, I knew better than to try and do it until they were, were, were ready, and which is a longer story. Uh, so what was quite fascinating about this is that the Oregon Blueberry Commission basically supported this project to get it established at about 33% of their total research budget went to this project to get it started. And almost all of that money came from conventional growers. And since then, the Washington Blueberry Commission has also supported this project. So we're looking at raised versus flat ground production. Flat, thinking it might be better for mechanical weed control. We have three different mulching treatments, sawdust mulch and hand hoeing, which is considered the organic standard a compost, yard debris compost topped with sawdust using organically approved herbicides uh, and hand hoeing as necessary or hand pulling, and then a landscape fabric with sawdust in the planting hole. And then we have two types of organically approved fertilizers. We have feather meal and fish emulsion at two different rates. And these rates are ones that I established based on earlier work I'd done with N15 using uh, inorganic fertilizers and to see if the plants and organic systems would need the same amount. And then we have two uh, cultivars, which are known for being different in vigor, and they have a different fruiting season. And as you've all heard, uh, they may not be as well adapted to organic systems. So just some sense of the findings. 
Uh, first of all, uh, weed pressure, as it does in most systems, has increased as the plant is aged. And what we found is that we generally, oops, let's go back. We generally have the greatest weed pressure in our compost topped with sawdust treatment, probably because as the sawdust blows away, weeds germinate readily in the compost. And so we've needed more hand labor weeding hours to control weeds in that system. We're also keeping track in that mulch of our cost for the herbicide that we've been using to control uh, weeds as necessary. The other interesting thing that came out of this is that a weed mat landscape fabric increases soil temperature, particularly in raised beds, and certainly when the planting is young, when the canopy is not shading the weed mat, we feel. And this has had implications for root growth, and those tubes that you see, we have cameras in the tubes and we're using mini rhizotrons to look at root growth and root life. When we're looking at uh, the impact of mulches on uh, soil properties, just a couple of things. High rates of fish emulsion are lowering our pH. Not a concern at the moment, but in a long-term sustainability standpoint, the pH might drop too low and not be, no longer be suitable for blueberries. In addition, looking at our mulches, the compost and sawdust sandwich, has helped mitigate these drops in pH. And right now, that's looking real appealing. Also, compost is very quickly, we think, increasing soil or mat organic matter content, and that's an advantage. So we've been hand harvesting our fruit through the life of this study. I'm selling the fruit to an organic uh, fresh fruit packer so that I face the same challenges and sort outs, et cetera, that growers do, and I know the economic returns. And what we're seeing is some dramatic results with raised being better than flat, even on our well-drained soil. Also, we have our best treatments, our high feather meal, compared to low rate of fish. Uh, these are very different costing products, and so that's something that we're keeping track of. If growers have similar results, maybe they'd prefer going with a lower cost product. And our best treatments have been the new treatments as compared to the industry standard of sawdust. The compost plus sawdust and the weed mat have been our best treatments. So we're collecting a lot of different data. I have a poster downstairs. I encourage you to look at that. And a couple of things related to this study. We are keeping track of costs, and we've documented a $7,000 an acre difference in these various production systems. And this is offering growers choices. We also uh, see with fish emulsion, increasing costs more than $3,000 an acre over feather meal and uh, similar yield. So that's interesting. And weed mat, which has led to higher yield and lower weed management costs if amortized over five years becomes the uh, option for growers if uh, at this stage of the study. So we are disseminating these findings uh, th to the industry using uh, field days at the North Willamette also a national blueberry tour, an international tour visited the site. We've had two webinars and publications on e-organic, and we're, our colleagues, my colleagues and myself, have given presentations worldwide. Our growers have been involved in presentations, and we are now working on extension and research papers with growers. And so e-organic, which is, I think, taping this, is uh, allowing us to reach an audience we not would otherwise not easily reach. And I think that's been a real advantage, and that's also funded by this NIFA program. So the preliminary impact of this particular pro uh, project is that organic acreage in the US has, has increased tremendously uh, over the last uh, five years or so. And uh, while we can't claim credit for that, I think the fact that uh, this project, as well as others on organic blueberries, are disseminating findings is helping uh, and we always better understand the risks that might be involved. We're also providing information on fertilizer and weed management systems, which are uh, assisting growers. One thing what we've definitely seen is conventional growers are jumping on our results also. For example, the use of landscape fabric or weed mat in the Pacific Northwest has increased from about 10% of new plantings to 80% of new plantings. And most growers are saying it's because of our positive findings. And raised beds are now really the only way to go in our region. So what I'd like to do now is give some highlights on um, different projects that are being funded through NIFA. She said 10. 
I'm kidding. <laughs> so we have different mulches being used in the southeast. Uh, and what we're seeing is that they're machine harvesting, predominantly rabbit eyes. And their organic mulch of pine bark is performing the best compared to a ground cover treatment. So it'll be interesting to see how this, uh, in our study, how these might differ between regions. And it's a, an example of why you need to do these things in different production regions, including the different pest pressures that are present in our different production regions for blueberries, for example. In uh, Georgia, they've also noticed an increase in organic uh, acreage that's planted and net returns for organic production systems have been higher so far, predominantly due to higher returns for fruit. Uh, Off-season production systems have been studied in uh, some of the regions and what they're finding is it's really key to look at these things because some things might happen that you don't expect. Like you might be able to advance production using uh, a tunnel. The control is the yellow line but when you advance production, if your tunnel doesn't provide warmer winter uh, night temperatures, excuse me, then you face frost risks. So, and growers need to know this. See, what are the added risks of growing in these types of production systems? In the um, Mid-South, we have some uh, stakeholder impact pact on designing and management projects. They have a poster downstairs, so I'm going to go through this quite quickly, but they're looking at off-season production systems for brambles and apples and are also involving stakeholders uh, in their study. They have interactive fruit budgets that assist growers in making choices. In uh, the Pacific Northwest, we've had a long-term sweet cherry project led by Dr. Anita Azarenko. In this particular project, very much stakeholder driven, also by conventional as well as uh, organic growers where their key interests also were weeds, but also soil health. And I'm hearing that a lot from growers, being interested in soil health, understanding why it's important and how it might impact things. And here they've been looking at mulches and comparing uh, landscape fabric to organic mulches. And here they have a lot of organic farms as well as conventional farms and, and Oregon State University farms involved in the project throughout Oregon. And that has had strong uh, benefits and buy-in from the industry. Organic matter under the uh, organic mulches has increased, whereas under weed mat it has de decreased over the life of the project, and there have been associated changes in soil health also. Now they still have a group of growers that work together to look at the yield and productivity of cherries from the soil up, a very different focus now than what used to be. Uh, this poster's downstairs. The organic apple project, looking at is it feasible in the New England area, and looking at the costs of different systems, and the uh, presentation of their uh, fabulous website information also. So uh, one thing I do want to finish up with is, is has this NIFA funding or NIFA funding, OREI funding, led to other, uh, other support? And it has, and we have several examples of that. I'm going to speak personally. After I got this uh, project funded through NIFA, the industry was very interested in looking at, well, are there varietal differences in blueberry and adaptation to organic production systems? And the industry has funded that research. So we're looking at that. We're also looking at uh, differences between these cultivars for uh, inorganic production systems for fruit set and the relationship between berry size and ripening in these different production systems. And there are other examples also uh, for the projects. Uh, one in particular, this is a poster downstairs, the California Strawberry Commission, uh, largely funded by uh, conventional growers, is now supporting, supporting Dr. Mazzola's work looking at incorporating brassica meal for disease suppression in strawberries. So I want to finish up with um, some of the challenges and directions that we have in, in organic fruit research is really these are all relatively new projects and we, we really need some of the long-term impacts. Right now, for example, we're going into the fifth season on our organic blueberry project. Our yields to date have been the same as what a conventional yield would be but our costs are higher, and our returns so far are higher. But we need to know uh, what is the long-term sustainability of this type of system. Also, crop rotational research is needed in strawberry, which is grown as a shorter-term perennial or as an annual in California. And an area for the future 
I think I'm starting to hear is carbon sequestration and life cycle analysis in organic fruit crop farms. Uh, marketers are starting to ask these questions and when it's market driven the growers uh, listen and are interested in that type of research. I'd like to add nutritional properties of fruit. The growers and industries that I talk to are not interested in comparing conventional to organic fruit in, in replicated plantings. I don't know how that would be designed anyway and still get certified, but they're not interested in that. They are interested in what are the healthful properties of organic fruit and what are the healthful properties of conventional fruit and not interested in comparing them from a marketing standpoint. So uh, the interesting discussion point. But there's been very little research about that in, in tree fruit or uh, berry crops. And finally, um, I would say continued funding at the federal level is needed for these large integrated projects. It's not something that our industries are capable of, of funding. Right, as uh, posters that are downstairs, so thank you. Okay, thanks.